Welcome to Author Master Insights. I am honoured and very excited, in fact, to have Dr. Emran Maya with us today. This is um, an incredible opportunity to learn from not only uh, an incredible thought leader from the from medicine, but an amazing author who's provided great breakthroughs in health and science. We're going to talk about both of these books here in a moment, The Mind-Gut Connection and The Gut Immune Connection. But before we do, just going to provide a little bit of background and introduction. Dr. Meyer is a gastroenterologist, neuroscientist, and distinguished research professor in the departments of medicine, physiology, and psychiatry at the David Geffen um, School of Medicine at UCLA. He's also the executive director of the G. Oppenheimer Center for Neurobiology of Stress and Resilience at UCLA and the co-director of the Cure Digestive Diseases Research Center. As one of the pioneers and leading researchers in the role of mind, brain, body interactions in health and chronic disease, in particular IBS, um, Dr. Meyer's scientific contributions to US national and international communities in the broad area of basic and a translational enteric neurobiology with wide ranging applications in clinical GI diseases and disorders is unparalleled. He's published more than 370 scientific papers and co-edited three books. He's also spoken at UCLA's TEDx on the mysterious origins of gut feelings and his best-selling book, The Mind and Gut Connection, published in um, 2015, became not only a bestseller, but it was really a breakthrough in the, the, the microbiome uh, interactions with mind. But today, with Prince, we're going to talk about what is very close to my heart as a chiropractor in the current world perspective, the gut immune connection, because the strength of the host is paramount with a person's ability to be resilient and function and live healthily in the current climate. So firstly, Dr. Meyer, welcome. It's great for, for us to have you here and to learn from you today. Marcus, thank you very much. I mean, I can't thank you enough for inviting me again. It's been, it's always been a pleasure to communicate with you and uh, discuss, you know, some of the topics that both of us are interested in and have very similar views on. Yeah. Well, we're speaking before I got on this call. I really feel like you have, you have the chiropractic audience um, at the heart of what we speak about, the strength of the host, the natural body's ability to heal and repair and function. So it's exciting for us to be able to share with you um, well, your message with, with the chiropractic audience because it is so parallel to what we do. But let's begin. Um, you know, something that you speak about so often um, is the fact that you know, there is a silent public health crisis and maybe a not so silent one in the current climate. So the, your message is about health. It's about healing. It's about the mind, the body, the immunity, all functions. So I'd love for you just to raise with everybody, you know, the, the thesis of your, your general you know, communication. Well, I mean, the thesis is that, um, you know, we all have focused on the, on the pandemic and, um, you know, both the, the shock of this pandemic and the devastating impact, but also the remarkable ability of the medical system to come up rapidly in record time with the vaccine, you know, which has really completely changed the world here in the U.S. And um, can imagine that even six months ago, you know, we were in lockdown and, and, and now we can walk around. Um, but almost almost unnoticed, you know, in in comparison to the attention this is that, that this pandemic got, is a, a chronic um, a chronic epidemic of um, non infectious diseases that we have been suffering from, um, basically starting you know about seventy five years ago after World War II. This has several reasons I don't want to get into, but. It's been a, a continuous increase in in our most common diseases, from you know cardiovascular disease to Alzheimer's to autism spectrum, colon cancer. Not only that, but we've seen that these trends started in the developed world, and now we're also observing it in the developing world. Um, and in addition, we've seen that um, it starts the problem starts in younger and younger populations. So, you know, uh, colon cancer screening, talking as a gastroenterologist, is now recommended at, at age 45. I'm absolutely convinced it will go, this age will go even further down uh, because now we're seeing that, you know, younger people are developing polyps and, and colon cancer. Um, and there's a prediction that, you know, we will have um, millions of people with Alzheimer's disease and, and Parkinson's disease as the population gets older into the centenarian 
range, you know, more where people are reaching that age. Um, and it's, there's, a, there's a, a strange phenomenon because, you know, the pharmaceutical industry and the medical system has focused on keeping people alive and functioning with these diseases. It's not been taken as serious as it should be. You know, people are not dying in the millions as we do in, in the pandemic. Um, if they stay alive, they actually get fairly old, but at an enormous cost of the medical and, you know, the medical system um, and tremendous profit of the pharmaceutical industry. Obviously, it's almost like you could say, you know, if you were a conspiracy theorist, you would say, you know, the pharmaceutical industry wants to keep these diseases alive because that's really a phenomenal uh, income source. So if you look at this together, this was the thesis of this book. I mean, is there some, because the time courses are similar, the age range is similar, uh, is, is there some similarity, some underlying cause for this, you know, other than the end result where you have a coronary artery uh, constriction, uh, where you have a, a, a tumor in, 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 your, in your large intestine? Is there something that, that is underlying these processes? And um, make a long story short, I come to the conclusion, you know, um, after two thirds of this book, the, the, the facts are laid out, that it's quite likely that um, a chronic inappropriate activation of the immune system, a low grade activation of the immune system um, plays a major role. Um, and that the main reason for this inappropriate immune system activation is the interaction of our unhealthy diet with the microbiome and the consequences on the gut. So as Hippocrates said, all diseases start in the gut. You could almost say all our chronic non-infectious diseases start in, in the gut. And I think this is, a, again, you, you know, in your first book, The, the Mind-Gut Connection, you really introduced the, the, the principle of the microbiome and its influence on the mind, the, the, the brain, the, the, the nervous system and the health of the body. And now what's, I think, really fascinating is the ability for the body to self-heal, the ability for the body to be able to be resilient to um, these inflammatory processes, the, the environmental toxins comes down to also that gut mi microbiome. And so the gut immune connection is really about understanding the influence of what's taking place, not only in the foods, but the, the environmental changes that are altering our gut. And therefore, failing to integrate this within a approach to care, almost having a functional medicine or integrated medicine, means that we're going to be reliant on external processes, like you said, pharmaceuticals, Whereas if we can strengthen the host naturally, if we can support the immunity naturally of the body, our ability to self-heal, self-regulate, self-organize is maximized. And for, as I said, this really sounds like a chiropractic conversation to me. And, you know, you, you've done, you're the, not only a thought leader in microbiome research, you're also with a best-selling author to bring this information out to the public. How is this information being received in the community? Are you talking about the... Um the patient community, the lay public, or in, in the medical? Well, let, let's talk about both of those, but let's talk about the patients because the patients are looking for hope first. The, the reader, somebody picks up your book, the gut immune connection and says, look, you know, how can I understand the connection with my food and my immune system? I want to regain my health. I want to be more resilient. I'm, I don't want to get feel like I'm vulnerable to, to infection or the inflammation and um, degenerative changes that's happening in my body and brain. I want to know that I've got control of my health. So... People picking up your book, it's, you know, you are a, a best-selling author. You've had massive exposure to a very wide audience. What is the message people are sharing with you in terms of feedback or the impact it's having? Let's start there. Yeah, so I would say it's been an interesting time that this book has come out because, there's a, as you know, there's a lot of discussion in the lay public and driven, fueled by um, social media and all kinds of cookbooks about the anti-inflammatory diet. And, um, you know, there, there, there has been like a groundswell of interest of the lay public in this particular topic. So when I started writing the book, that was not the primary thing on my mind. I mean, I thought it's a good time to write it, but I did not realize how um, intense the interest is. And it's particularly interesting to me because 
you know, I've been interested in brain gut interactions throughout my career for, you know, 35 years. I've had NIH grants, given talks, written lots of papers on it. That interest was never really there. You know, there's something has happened in the mind of people that they feel, um, and it's, it's a combination. It's a combination of um, focusing on a likely cause, which has to do with diet. Um, um, also, giving a message that this is something that you can control. Uh, it's not something you need the medical system or you need the pharmaceutical system until things have gotten so out of hand that obviously if you have advanced Parkinson's disease, it's, you're not going to be able to help yourself, neither with it, uh, metastatic colon cancer. Um, but that's not what, what I'm, that's not the audience that I'm addressing. I'm addressing people, patients with these diseases or they don't even have them diseases like 40 years earlier, you know, that instilling this, this mentality that, that you can be in charge of your health by doing a few very simple things, you know, um, simple things in terms of uh, lifestyle. Um, and I, I make a big uh, point out of this, you know, not only what you eat, but when you eat it and where your food comes from and what it does to the environment. So, that consciousness that food is not just gobbling down a hamburger um, and with French fries, but that every time you sit down to eat something, this goes through your mind. Initially, you have to train yourself, but ultimately becomes subconscious, and you will have a very different relationship to you know you eat to what you eat. The same thing with exercise; it should become a lifestyle, not that something that you do when you're. So, you know, our, our son is 24 years old and goes to the gym every day. Uh, you should use that kind of mentality throughout your life. You will adjust what kind of exercises you do, but it should be a daily thing. And um, same with your sleep hygiene um, and the same with the processing of stress of, of life in general, of how your stress reactivity. So I, I think a lot of people are finding that very attractive. Often, I don't know, is this, am I, in a, when I give these, these talks to educated um, podcast hosts, is this like an echo chamber because all these hosts sort of agree with my message <laughs> and the majority of the population is on a totally different wavelength. They, they won't change their dietary habits. They will not, you know, go on to a different, a, a largely plant-based diet. That's... I think that process is much slower, but certainly living in Southern California in California or in the West Coast of LA, of, of California and, in, and, and, and the US in general, I have a feeling that this, there's a very receptive audience now from young people um, to, the, to the elderly. Um, I don't know how it is in Australia. I would imagine it's kind of similar. Um, the parts of the population are not receptive, but but in general, I think this feels falls on a very receptive audience and people are willing to change. A lot of people are confused what to do because there's so many different messages out there uh, from a keto diet and paleo diet and, um, you know, that, and it almost becomes a religion for many people, what they eat. And it becomes political because uh, if you talk about reducing your red meat intake, you view it as some, um, you know, liberal uh, person who is attacking traditional national habits and <laughs> cultural habits. Um, so, yeah, overall, I would say it's a, it's a good time to spread this message, and it's very important to do it in a, in an evidence based way. And I think that's a really key thing I want, I want to mention there. Before the gut immune connection came out, this this sits on my you can't see, but over there, I've got a, a shelf of, of books in my in my office. I also have a, a library out there, and I have a copy of this in my office and a copy outside. And so when I'm with my clients to utilize the authority of a book and authority of an international best-selling person, I remind them of the significance of the diet and nutrition. And so it actually creates a positive way of reinforcing the message that we want. We want them to get adjusted. We want them to exercise well, take time out for rest and relaxation, but most importantly, look at their diet and nutrition to reduce the inflammatory factors of food. But now what's going to be super exciting to have the gut new connection is when we want, when the when the, the patient comes in and they have some level of 
you know, fear about what's taking place in their world. They, they, you know, is there any resilience? They, we talk in our practice about the strength of the host. Um, we, we don't want people to be fearful of a virus if they can be immunologically strong and competent, have both immune resilience and psychological resilience. So the ability to use an evidence-based approach saying, look, we know that when you choose the right foods and you've got chapters in here on sleep hygiene as well as uh, exercise and its impact on natural immunity. And so when we have this conversation, we use the authority of a book, the research inherent within that book, we have the opportunity to equip and empower the patient to make those choices with confidence and knowing that they will then come into a state or space of that resilience supported by the care that we deliver in practice. And it's therefore unifying the message, um, which is why I really think in, in heart, your message is a chiropractic message as much as it is a health message, because this is the story we tell our clients, have a strong host by making healthy and positive choices. So I think that evidence-based approach is an important element. So when coming back to the research, you've got an enormous amount of citations in here and some research that you've obviously you, you yourself have delivered, but you've brought other um, information in there. So what is the cutting edge research at the moment? What is research sh showing about our immune system, the strength of the host and sleep and exercise and food choices so that we can be confident in delivering that education to our patients? So in each of these areas, um, you know, there are, um, there are scientific data. Um, the good, the I mean, the good news is there's a lot of um, research and evidence to support each of these lifestyle choices and the combination that, you know, you can add 10 years of, um, of disease-free longevity by following when you're 50, a study out of Harvard, that, that if you follow these lifestyle um, recommendations, you can add, which is amazing, 10, you know, 10 extra years where you don't have to depend on multiple medications in the healthcare system. Um, the, the bad news is we don't, many of these studies are um, cross-sectional um, and uh, observational. Um, they're, not, they're not really identifying cause and effect necessarily because, so if you compare two population, one that pursues the healthy lifestyle and the other one doesn't, um, even though the researchers try to match as much as possible to every other factor and control for other factors, it's, it's quite possible or likely that if you eat a healthy diet, you have a different mindset uh, to start out with. You have a, a more health promoting um, mindset, more resilient mindset, um, and you will do certain things that that will contribute to the benefit. So you can't just say it's this one thing, you know, it's, it's, it's a diet that causes this longevity. Um, but there are now studies coming up that are more difficult to do. They're, you know, they have to be longitudinal in large samples, large populations. Um, you have to make sure that um, in, the, in the intervention group, people actually are doing these things like with a diet study, uh, you know, um, uh, Diet assessment by questionnaires is notoriously inaccurate and unreliable. People may do something totally different as they indicate on their questionnaire. But there are now studies that, you know, people, uh, multi center studies often that actually prove the causality that we've long suspected because we have, we have data from hundreds of thousands of these cross sectional observational epidemiological studies. So I would say something I'm emphasizing in the book that you know, for the lay person that is, may, may not sound that important, but for scientists, it is important that you can prove causality between, that, that's basically the scientific principle, um, causality between, between one factor and the consequence. Um, and I think that like in, um, in Alzheimer's disease, for example, there's, you know, a study that I quote in, 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 in the book um, where people on, they were put on a, Mediterranean type intervention, um, they changed their, their gut microbiome composition, their metabolites, their inflammatory markers. And uh, ultimately that was reflected in a slowing or reversal of cognitive decline. Um, so the, the, the good news is lots of data to support it. Um, the bad news is we still have a long way to go to really, for those people that need this. So I often say, 
if 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 you're a non-scientist, you know, you pretty much know the answer to many of these things. It's the lifestyle, you know, and it's the regular lifestyle. Um, and it's only a few things that you need to follow. For the scientists, there's still decades to go to prove all these all, all these points. And to me, it's always interesting, you know, having done science for, for the better part of my career. Somehow the the, the lay public doesn't even care anymore if that's if that science comes or not. You know, they already know what they want to do because um, it's been promoted by, you know, by by non scientific channels, by authors, and um, so it's it's it is interesting. You know, we, we're, we're rediscovering. Um, you know, it's it's almost like Back to the Future. We're, we're rediscovering ancient wisdom and, and and knowledge now with the scientific um, support of it love that well what i just and i'm going to come to some other points i want to i want to really share with the, uh, with the audience today but i loved what you said there is if you are a thought leader you become an author the credibility purely of that positioning allows you to generate action with your audience even if the science is not necessarily there and then the science will catch up and reinforce and prove what it is that you do if you're making a positive, um, delivering a positive and, you know, almost holistic message because these truths are immutable. These ancient wisdoms of sleep well, exercise regularly, choose whole nutritious foods, um, make certain that you're making positive lifestyle choices. And as a chiropractor, we'll say also get adjusted. The science will evidence what we do. And then when we write a book, we have the ability to influence our audience. And, and that's why I highlighted and said, what I'm going to do, and that point that you just said really, really excites me. I'm going to bring this out when people are saying my immune system is weak. And I say, look, the research is in. The, a world-class speaker, a world-class researcher has already provided us the decisions we need to make. If you want a strong immunity, we need you to follow this food recommendation. We need you to get your sleep. We need you to do your exercise. We'll obviously add to that, we need you to get adjusted. And that authority from your book, from the research, allows us to speak with authority. We almost transition the authority you've given us in the research and in the book and pass it onto our and onto our patients to direct their actions. This that, that was really cool because then you can say, you want another 10 years of health? 10 years. You want your brain not to decay? Follow my recommendations. That. That, may, that to me is cool. Sorry, yeah, I'm going to go, off and you these, go. Yeah, and these and these two years, uh, these these ten years, you know, they, they the meaning of that becomes changes with age. You know, I, I just had a conversation earlier today. Um, a colleague of mine retired from UCLA. Um, actually, this this weekend um, at age seventy, and you know, he still was successful, had grants and everything, and his family, his sons, really got him into making this decision and. Then we had a conversation about it and he said, you know, if I'm lucky, uh, so he's 70, you know, he said, if I'm lucky, I have 10, 10 healthy productive years where you don't have to go constantly to the doctor and get this medication. This way. And this is really the truth. You know, if you're 30, obviously you don't think about these 10 extra years, but when you're 70, it makes a huge difference, you know? And I, I think, um, I, I mean, I would almost say for, the people that should read this book the most are the ones in this in this age range because they are closer to developing cognitive decline and developing Parkinson's disease and like all these things that you know um, basically prevent a healthy, uh, enjoyable uh, uh, you know last phase of your of your life. So yeah, my my recommendation is if 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 you're in the midst of your vitality, you're 18 or you're 25, and you know you can do a lot of things that are not so good for your body if you at some point change to the healthy thing. But it becomes crucial, you know, the closer you get to that to that uh, phase of life that you know we all want to extend. But what what use is there in extending it and becoming 100 years old if you're frail and uh, you know can't think properly anymore and don't have the muscle strength to to do. So I, I think that's, you know, uh, uh, that's another important point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before we wrap up here, I've got a, a question. I know you speak particularly on the One Health concept, and I would love for you to share this with the chiropractic audience because we, we share a 
a similar philosophy. So in the book, you talk about One Health and, and this is a philosophy you bring into your writing and, and into your overall health message. So can you share a little bit more what you mean by one the One Health concept and, and why it's relevant and pertinent, particularly now? Yeah, so most people, when they talk about health, they talk about their own personal health. It's actually very selfish. You know, it's, it's ingrained in the Western philosophy, uh, you know, general philosophy of the importance of the self and individual, and you just really are concerned about your own health and your own gut health. And um, but then, when you really dive dive deep into it, uh, you realize so there's the health of your gut microbes, the ecosystem that lives inside of you, which is not yourself. It's another entity that interacts closely with you. But you should be very concerned and and, and care for the health of the microbiome and by feeding it the things that they need to have diversity and resilience, then the health of this microbiome translates directly into the health of your gut because the the gut permeability is that's the the gateway to the immune system. So if that gut health, this this gut barrier, this this epithelial barrier is uh, disturbed, then now you get this low-grade immune activation and then um, then you talk about the health of the body, the health of your brain, the organs, uh, which are all interconnected. It's not like, uh, you know, you only, uh, if you have metabolic syndrome or if you're obese, that it's only your appearance. It's, it's all the other stuff that goes on in that network of, of, of your body, of this ecosystem. But then when you talk about a healthy diet, you have to think about what, where does this food come from and, and how is it grown? Um, so this is relevant both for, for the, the animal-based food component, but also for the plants. Um, so I make a big point to write a chapter about this, the, the, how the health of the soil microbiome is crucial for the health benefits of the plants that we eat. So the phytonutrients um, that, are, that convey, so there's fiber and there's the phytonutrients that convey this health benefit of, 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 of plant-based food. And if this food is grown in, a, in our chemical agriculture system where the microbes in the soil are pretty much suppressed or, or you know, gone, um, and the plants are, are, on, are essentially like on, 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 on steroids because you put all this fertilizer in it and they grow, but no longer with the help of the bacteria. So the plants, are, the soil is not healthy, the plants are not healthy. And then depending on our eating habits, so if we pursue this typical Western, and I would say excessive meat consumption that's become possible with subsidies of meat production, uh, then you know, we have the consequences that um, the, the deforestation in, in, in the Amazonian rainforest to make room for uh, soybean uh, you know, mass production in monocultures, um, and that has a major effect cutting down the rainforest, obviously now on climate change. And so it's absolutely fascinating to me how, and I spend the whole chapter on this network science, you know, that we now have tools, mathematical tools to understand how these systems are interconnected uh, from the microbes, the invisible, the tiniest part of this network to the, the, the whole planet. Um, and that w- the, the thing that we're seeing today with all our crisis going on is um, ill health or disease of the whole system. And it ranges from, you know, the microbes, the soil, the, um, all the way to our, to our climate. And this is another point of the awareness. I think that's really important. Um, this interconnectedness of, of phenomena in, in, in our world. Um, you, 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 I mean, I think, we, we can no longer afford to go through life with this selfish um, um, perception of reality that it's only our self that's, that is important. Our, our self is just one part of this gigantic network of, of players and nodes and connections. Um, and yeah, so it, I mean, it almost becomes this kind of philosophical or religious or you know, Buddhist kind of framework. But I didn't come to this from a religious standpoint, quite honestly. So I, I, I come to it from a scientific standpoint, and I find that I would predict that with a lot of certainty, it will become the dominant paradigm 
of, of the world in the future. This may take, you know, 50 years in some places. It may take uh, 100 years. We may have to go through many crises, many more crises and, and, and catastrophes. But ultimately, I think this will be the philosophy that, that, we'll, that the One Health concept that, that what we'll have to adopt or adapt. Such a powerful message, and I think there is an interconnectedness of all things and what you do to the, the least of us, you do to the greatest of us. So it is in, it's an inherent philosophy, but now philosophy and science actually meet in a, in a profound model, and, and it's really paradigm shifting. And which is why when, when we, I alluded to that earlier, uh, the question was, you know, how has this been received? And we spoke about the, the wonderful way that you know, the community is now saying, I want to take responsibility for my health, and the books have really driven that process. How has this been received within the medical community? Because as, as a chiropractor, will listen to this interview and when they pick up your book and they read this and they go, this makes sense to me. How has it been in, in the chiropractor and the, the, in the functional medicine and the integrative doctors will all, I think, really deeply appreciate this. But what was, what's the response within medicine? Because let me just say, before you answer this question, a chiropractor loves a maverick. All chiropractors are mavericks. So this is almost a maverick message when you are paradigm shifting so you know you are part of an established medical framework i'd love to hear your journey now yes so i i would say you know um many of the podcast hosts that were interested in, in interviewing me um like mark hyman for example obviously uh, uh, you know somebody who's uh, is, 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 a, is a very prominent functional medicine um um, proponent and uh, there's, I mean, there's several others. So it's definitely been similar to what you say that it fits with the chiropractic model. It fits really well with the functional medicine model. I'm a little bit on the skeptical side with many of the functional medicine claims because there are claims that are not really based on, on science or on half science. Um, and so um, I think you know, with, with, with the chiropractic model, I'm, you have been the main person. I've actually talked to a couple of other uh, podcast hosts. Um, I have, I've talked to a couple of my colleagues in, in Western medicine, um, but they call themselves integrative gastroenterologists. So they're not the garden variety <laughs> uh, gastroenterologists. Um, um, you know, Dr. Chutkan and, uh, Dr. Dr. Will Bulsevich, uh, you know, pretty prominent in the, in the field, they have adopted the same philosophy that you know that, that I've been promoting. But I don't know how it's perceived. So when I give a talk, when, when I get invited to give a talk at Columbia University to my medical to my gastroenterology colleagues, I I use a different language. Obviously, you know, I don't get into the philosophy. Um, so. I don't even know exactly what the perception has been. And then there's been the pandemic. So I don't interact with, with my colleagues or have interacted with them on the same uh, frequency. So I would say it was very well received by, by other sections of the healthcare system that, um, that share a similar holistic philosophy. Um, and by the few of my colleagues that have made that transition in, in, in gastroenterology. But I would not really know um, overall, you know, about the traditional medical system, how, how they look at it. I'll give you one example, you know, I'm not allowed to promote my books in at UCLA, um, and I don't know if that's because they're, they're, they're somewhat critical of the traditional medical model, uh, or they claim it's because they don't want me to make money. Um, through my connections to the faculty and all this. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's in some ways the least uh, concern that I have to make money on this. Um, what I want is to have this platform, this large platform to reach as many people as possible, you know, to, to change their consciousness. I mean, it's, it's almost like a, it's almost become a, a, a mission for me to do that. And um, so, but I always found it kind of intriguing that, the institution that where I trained and that I respect highly for their science would not allow me to to publicize the book, you know. So it's well, I think that's that, that is fascinating, and we, and we won't draw conclusions from that other than that it's it's our hope that you know this again paradigm shifting consciousness evolving message gets into as many hands as is possible. 
Uh, I, I just want to thank you, one, for, for the writing of the book. And as I said, I'm, I'm personally excited. And I, as a chiropractor's watches here, you, you buy a copy of this, you put it on your shelf. And for me, this is my new conversation. You want 10 extra years of good health? You want to avoid the decline of neurodegeneration? We've got some recommendations. We want you to follow those recommendations. The evidence is in the world thought, the, the world leaders, the thought leaders in this area of both research and clinical practice allow us to give you this recommendation. So for that, I am grateful. Um, everyone watching this, you know, Dr. Meyer is an incredible thought leader in this area. Jump on board, grab that copy of both of those books, read it, become informed, and again, elevate the consciousness of our patients and therefore our communities. Dr. Meyer, before we conclude, is there any other message you'd love to share to bring this to a conclusion? I'm, I'm excited to have brought this, but I'd love for you to just to wrap up it and a power message. You've just said that you want to change consciousness. This is the platform is all about that. I'd love for you to, to, to conclude with any, any final messages you have. Yeah, I I would say, you know, um, our, our brains are the, the most powerful computers that, that are, and we don't know about the universe, but certainly on this planet, um, and we underutilize them. You know, we, we live according to um, principles that are instilled in us in school and kin from kindergarten on. We don't question them. We, we don't use it in a way to really... Um, be mindful of things that are important for our health and for you know the health of our environment and our planet. So my um, plea is that really everybody makes that realization. You know, we, we haven't used the, the term mindfulness, but clearly when we talk about the you know the brain, mindfulness has become something very popular nowadays. I think you you have to apply it to to your lifestyle. Um, and there's a big thing in in the whole, in all the meditative and um, templative uh, practices that you don't just think about or not mindful just about yourself, but also what impact this has on, on, on the, the world around you. And, and, and so I would make that, that mindfulness pitch. Um, if you start with that um, and then you put in the few things that you need to learn, which are not rocket science, you know, the, yeah, the science the science itself is rocket science because you deal with enormous amounts of data and things. But the recommendations in this book are not are not uh, rocket science. They're pretty straightforward. And, you know, so I would make a plea for people to become mindful of um, how they live, what impact this has on their own body um, and on uh, the on the rest of the world around us, including, you know, climate change and um, so I, I think that's sort of my plan. And I'm, I'm really grateful. You know, it's, it's sort of thinking back when you first contacted me, I never thought we would have such a <laughs> strong bond in terms of our philosophies and coming from very different directions to this. But that makes it uh, even more exciting to me to, you know, to be in the same wavelength with, with a, a prominent representative from, from, a, from a very different world and of, of, of healing. And um, so thanks for this opportunity. You're welcome. And, 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 and Dr. Cameron, we, we really do feel like we're on the same wavelength because, you know, the, in chiropractic, there's a, chiropractic has a philosophy. And it, in fact, chiropractic without its philosophy really is not chiropractic at all. And so when you talk of these principles, we feel that unifying message. And, you know, the developer of chiropractic, um, he, you know, he has a term called BJ's Utopia. And that is that we as chiropractors have the opportunity to create a better world, a healthier world where people think more clearly, where they are mindful and they elevate their, you know, their consciousness through, you know, the, the prefrontal cortex of the ability to, to express itself fully and completely. So when you speak, I feel a strong affinity. When I read your words, I feel like you're speaking to me and then I can speak and then through me because there is that relationship. So I want to appreciate you in your message and I want to you know, share, share you with the chiropractors because chiropractors love the truth and you embody and speak truth and for that I'm grateful. Dr. Emma Meyer, it has been an honour, it's been a pleasure and I'm grateful for our continued our connection and relationship. It's wonderful to have that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Marcus.